computer. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So uh, tonight I'm joined by Elizabeth, who is in Hawaii. <laughs> My teacher, Elizabeth Jenkins. And you can see the lovely Hawaiian background she has there. I believe this is just outside her house. <laughs> So, um, Elizabeth's going to, uh, Elizabeth's my teacher from, we were just trying to work this out, I think it was um, 2016, I went to one of her workshops in Greece, followed swiftly after by Italy, and then um, I went out to her, her, do the PACO training in Hawaii, which was pretty magnificent. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I've been like a groupie ever since. <laughs> and we went to Peru. We went to Peru. And then we went to Peru right after that. And then I think I went back to Hawaii the following year. So it was just like, yeah, she can't get rid of me that easily. <laughs> so um, I've asked Elizabeth to come along so that she can tell us a little bit more about the Nyawis. But first of all, um, Elizabeth, could you please introduce yourself and tell us how you came to the Andean tradition? Long story. <laughs> Long story short. Well, it is morning here in Hawaii. It's still, <laughs> still morning, so that yeah. part is accurate. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alina, for having me. This is so fun to be able to chat about this, this beautiful tradition, this beautiful subject on this medium, which who we never thought we'd be doing this. We, I mean, I never thought. Mm -hmm. doing all these things on video. Um, <clears throat> 1988, I was in the midst of my uh, PhD in clinical psych and it was really kind of my biggest, deepest prayer was to find real healing for people. And I was getting a bit dissatisfied with the kind of um, smallness of the psychotherapy framework and the psychology framework and the diagnostic and statistical manual lists of everything wrong with us without a real, uh, well, what is mental health? You know, what is it? How do we define it? What, what is it? And so on that note, I kind of went off to Peru to join a, a friend of mine who'd gone off to study with the shamans, searching in the same way as me for real healing. Um, and long, long, long story, very short, I ended up having um, a very powerful visionary experience of one of the sacred deities of the Andean people, Apu Ausangate, the mountain spirit of Ausangate Mountain. And this uh, just kind of catapulted me on this wild adventure into the mystical tradition of the Andes and into the real, uh, what I eventually found, it wasn't easy, but after several years of earnestness, <laughs> earnest investigation, um, I was able to meet a beautiful, amazing man named Juan Nunez del Prado, who really had done the same thing as me in a certain way, gone for what he really was called to do by his own inner voices um, to follow uh, and learn about the mystical wisdom tradition of his own land. And because of his beautiful explanation of the framework and understanding of the, the fourth level of the tradition, which is a higher level of, of wisdom, because he was so generous to share it with me. I, I found what I'd been seeking the whole time in my, my first call to go there. It took about five years till I found him, I think in, in four years in 91. And then we began working together um, I, oh, for 10 years, pretty much. Uh, doing lots and lots of trainings and bringing lots of people to Peru and studying the tradition and working in the collective with the with the um, it, nature wisdom tradition that is Andean mysticism and finding the beauty and the joyousness and the 
healing and the happiness that comes from and, and the organic quality of wisdom unfolding in the body, uh, I guess for me, and having my intuition just validated in so many ways and having kind of the, my rational cage of, you know, this is what life is, just be blown open and reconstructed, reconfigured by a much more natural, what feels like a more accurate perception of the world and explanation of how things work in the Kaosai Pacha, the world of living energies and, and being in harmony with great nature. So this is my luck and my honor and my deepest gratitude to this tradition, to Juan, uh, for following his inner guidance and all of us who have gotten on the path, you know, feeling, finding a place that feels like home. So that is the glory of it and the, the magical beauty of it. Find something simple, organic, just feels truthful, truthful way to be in sacred reciprocity with with our mother nature and our planetary body, Pachamama, and all of the natural world, which is so sustaining to our, our minds, our bodies, our souls. That's what it's all about for me. Yeah. Sharing that with others, what a joy. It's absolutely a delight and an honor. Pretty beautiful, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, um, so I'm kind of focusing on the Nyawis right now because I'm going to be doing a, a workshop on them soon. And, um, well, it's a course, but um, so I'm really like trying to like focus in on uh, what the Nyawis are and what they mean to you and whatever. So could you give us your explanation of what the Nyawis are? Absolutely. Um, of course, Nyawi just literally means I in Quechua. And um, as all these words in Quechua, they have a physical and a energetic meaning. So uh, the Nyawis kind of define the Inca energy system as the chakras define the Hindu energy system. But the Inca energy system is completely different. And uh, for me, feels absolutely natural and uh, organic in my body. So the beauty of it is having an energy system that connects us directly with nature. So there, there are basically seven nyawis and this is how nature makes its home in our body. And for me, this is the, the fundamental power of this energy system is that it connects us with the larger living system that is mother nature. And <clears throat> I think it's, it's our biophilic instinct, our instinct to connect with larger living systems. And here's the exact method to do it. Mm -hmm. um, there's evolutionary psychologists and even biologists that say, this is our instinct, our instinct to evolve, our instinct to connect with the larger living system. So the Nyawis are the energy centers in our body that open to receive these forces of nature. So the Siki Nyawi in our sacrum is connected to water. Mm -hmm. So different than the Hindu system, which has earth at the base. Mm -hmm. So I believe it's my conjecture. It's not anything that I was taught by any of the Andean masters, but I believe it makes sense, it's logical that the system comes from an earlier time when we, were st we still had our tails in the water <laughs> before we stood up on the land, yeah. <laughs> so uh, tail in the water, belly connected to the earth, our koskonyawis, our belly eye, our heart eye, songkonyawi uh, connects to the sun, our throat eye connects to the wind, moon and stars and and our fifth and sixth and seventh eye connect to the cosmos. So 
There are beautiful meditations that we can do to enhance this connectedness and to drink the delicious nectars of nature that come from these sources. And so this is, for me, the beauty and simplicity of the tradition. We don't need anyone to do it for us. We can make our own connection with these natural forces. And literally feel for me it's like it's like our energetic immune system if you're drinking in these delicious nectar it's like an ecstatic practice mm. of drinking in this nature nectar it's healing it's delicious it's uh, an ecstatic kind of very sensuous practice of being literally viscerally, energetically, spiritually, psychologically, emotionally connected mm. to our planet. Yeah. Mm. In a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I don't need to ask you any questions. I'm just going to sit back and <laughs> let you just talk. It's so interesting just to listen. Uh, okay. So, and... Um, so everybody has like, I know uh, Juan and Ivan have like a very specific way of what way they work with the Nyawis and can you give us, um, we'll, we'll go into uh, in a bit more detail with each Nyawi, uh, but like an overview of what way you work with them. If for somebody that's like brand new to this tradition that, that wouldn't have worked with Absolutely. the eyes before. I think um, <clears throat> for me, there's a, a few kind of basics that you need. And the way I teach in my seminars is to use our little Andean power pillow, you know, the Misha. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh goodness, it's disappearing in the tree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bing. Mm -hmm. And of course these are, um, mostly rocks but they're connected to the living energy of all my teacher mountains and and uh water bodies that i work very closely and intimately with i think that's the other thing that i would say is this is a very intimate and personal practice and so i like it to be a very open experience of receiving these nature nectars in whatever way each individual receives them because we all perceive living energy in a different way some of us are more visual some of us are more visceral and kinesthetic in how we perceive mm -hmm. and some of us are more intuitive um, or even auditory or taste and smell olfactory so the way each of us does it uh, is right. It's the right way to connect. And because it's so personal and unique to each person. So I like to, to help uh, open the Nyawis. It's a ceremony called Nyawi Kichai. And I do it with the Misha, just calling that force, like for example, calling the force of water into my Misha, connecting my own tail to the water and then um, placing this on the tail eye of whoever I'm working with or doing an initiatory process with and having them invite the living spirit of water. And it's always giving and receiving. So you're offering anything that needs to come out of your tail eye that needs to be cleaned, released, offering that and receiving the delicious nectar of the water in your tail. Yeah, and then doing the same at the belly eye. Um, one Native American teacher I worked with a long time ago said, Americans and Western people look really funny because it's like you have these energetical umbilical cords that are waving around in the air and they're not connected. So after our, our mother gives birth, we're supposed to plug those into the earth because the earth becomes our mother after we leave our biological mom's womb 
and that connection is that physical umbilical cord is severed, the energetical one needs to be plugged into the bigger mom, Pachamama. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's exactly what we do in, in this practice is to open our belly eyes and plug them in to the earth and offer any huchas, any heavy energies, anything that's ready to, you know, that needs to flow out of us because we're always breathing in and out. We're taking in fresh new energy and we're exhaling what needs to leave. And so it's the same with the energy eyes of the body. So we offer <clears throat> right to the mother water, what's in our tail eye that needs to leave and we drink in her delicious nectar. We offer what's ever in our belly eye to Pachamama, to mother earth, and we drink in her nectar. And we offer what's ever in our heart eye to the sun, to Intitaita, to the living being that is the sun. And we drink in this delicious golden nectar of the sun. I mean, what could be more fun? <laughs> what could be more absolutely exquisite? Um, we offer anything that's in our throat. You know, think of the our unspoken words. Sometimes it's it's pain, sometimes it's anger, sometimes it's love that we don't allow out of our throats, this energy center here. So we offer all that that needs to be released and we receive the delicious silver nectar of the wind, the moon, the stars here. Yeah, and circulating these so we have the, the sacred eyes, the nyawis, that we open and we initiate the relationship with, we establish the relationship with these nature forces, these teachers, these great beings, call them the texeabus, and, <clears throat> and then we receive these nectars and the energy system is comprised of eyes and belts. So we have a belt. Uh, that circulates around us. For example, the heart eye is here connected to the sun and we weave the golden belt. It has a root in the back, right? And we weave the golden belt between the eye and the root circulates around our torso. The red, uh, the cosconyawi, the belly eye, um, drinks, we drink in the nectar of Pachamama and circulate that belt around our waist between our belly and the, the root in the back and then our tail eye is the one that's in the face's back um, <clears throat> and that eye we open and drink in the the nectar of the water and circulate with the with the root which is you know more like around the pubic area and we circulate the black belt there yeah red belt in the belly, golden belt around the torso, silver belt here, and then kind of these three points um, that connect to the cosmos. So it's a way of literally kind of breathing in and out nectar into our body and recharging our, our own energy system. Feels like, I, I like to call it the energetic immune system because it feels like that when you're full of nectar, your bubble, you know, the energy field of the body that's called the bubble in, in Quechua. When you are full, you know, there's no room for anything else to, to come in. And I love that in this tradition, our job is to be full of nectar mm -hmm. so we can give it to everyone else that we encounter and to be constantly refilling our nectar with these unlimited sources of of power of life force of living energy of delicious clean pure energy it's like this is the energy we run on and it's it's limitless it's infinite for us the sun is infinite source you know for us mm. you know we live five billion years which probably won't happen immediately <laughs> maybe later <laughs> so 
yeah, getting to know intimately, personally, and feeling that connection and that delicious circulation, opening the eyes and circulating the belts. So that's how I do it. That's how I like to work with it. And then, of course, we use all these nectars to um, germinate our Inca, our Koya seed, our seed of potential inside us that allows us to develop to the higher levels that are defined in the tradition and various books and things. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Okay. So. I know of like sometimes when I've been working with you there's we've had like shared some amazing stories about the things that we've encountered and what we've seen and whatever and and can you give us a direct experience of something that's happened to you when you're working through one of the eyes or um, one of the belts or um Huh. Well, maybe a vision or something like that that you saw or, or some kind of experience yeah for me the most exciting part of the work is how we can connect to others and actually circulate the belts together you can do it with a partner mm -hmm. and circulate the black belt between the two of you you can circulate the red belt and therefore and in that way you each take advantage of the connection the other person has mm -hmm. because we all are different some of us organically naturally the way we're designed we perhaps connect really easily with the sun in our heart but more difficult with the earth in our belly or more difficult with our tail in the water um, so when we share it, when we do the collective practice, that's really, really beautiful for me. And um, one time <laughs> when we were doing this collective practice, I was working with the woman who was from Guyana and um, <clears throat> she, was, she was calling her Pacarina, her, her nature mom, before we started the practice. And as we were circulating the belts, I could literally feel the jungle. I didn't know where she was from or, or any of this information, but she started to connect to her home place, which is a, the jungle. And I could hear the animals and I could smell the smells of the jungle. And I felt like I could have stepped through her bubble like a portal and gone into the jungle. It was, it was that visceral of a sensation. And at the end, I, I said to her, we were finished because we were connecting the belts together. We were calling the water and connecting our black belts, calling the earth, connecting our red belts. And when we had finished all the belts, I said to her, I had the most odd experience. It was like your bubble became the jungle. And, and she said, oh my God, that's exactly what happened because I was calling my motherland which is the jungle in Guyana and and it was crazy <laughs> it's like you could imagine that this could happen wow so that was quite quite surprising and it's always surprising you don't know what's gonna happen you know yeah. it's never the same twice yeah yeah yeah, it's really nice that you can have like such a direct experience like this. Like Juan's always talking about the Andean tradition being like, you know, you're direct, you know, it's like you're, you're able to, it's a tangible kind of thing that you can taste with all your senses. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Very sensual and very personal. You don't need an intermediary to tell you what it's about. And I think the other thing about that that's super important for this time is that we all need to be the boss of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, when we trust ourselves more, you know, the, uh, the tradition believes we come from original virtue, not original sin. There's mm -hmm. no such thing as original sin. It's, it's kind of a weird idea if you think about it. You look at babies and, like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. That is divine purity, you know. So 
<clears throat> if we trust ourselves, we come from original virtue, we're all a little piece of the divine and we trust that. We trust our nature. We trust mother nature. We're part of, you know, that's the thing. We start to feel, experience ourselves and act as if we are part of this living system of nature. Then you begin to cultivate this respect for nature and this personal connection. You can't do things the same anymore. Mm. You know, you can't abuse resources because you've spoken to those resources and they've answered back. You know, my, my other experience here is actually defending a beautiful sacred black sand beach against developers who wanted to come and kind of, you know, put up their hotels and all that stuff. And there were very many endangered species on that beach. And after three years of literally protecting and defending her with our lives and our putting our bodies on the line and a whole group of people that have the same feeling, the same love, um, actually going to the beach after that whole thing was over and seeing this beautiful woman, this Nusta, this nature being, this goddess of that area, stand up out of the water with her top knot like a Polynesian traditional uh, long, long, long black hair at the top knot. And she swirled her top knot around and said, this is my domain and I am the guardian of this. And this is the birth of a new, you're, I'm guarding the, this birth. And that's why you all were feeling so passionate because I was like, Arr, you know, like a mom defending a, a child, that kind of fierceness. And she said, and, and she said, because the new island is coming up here. And that was the first time I'd even, the thought had even crossed my mind. Oh my God, of course, this beach is directly in front of where this new island is coming up. This is the site of a birthing process that's going on. My God, of course it has to be protected and defended. It can't be filled with pollution from golf courses and chemicals and junk that they were trying to do. So um, yeah, that's another kind of like powerful, powerful, personal, visionary experience of seeing these nature beings, you know, which we begin to speak to you, you know, when we speak to them, they, they answer. Mm -hmm. We ask them for help, but they ask us for help. It's a two-way street. Yeah. <laughs> Great. This is exactly what I want to hear. <laughs> um, so with each Nyawi, um, so can you, can you give us a, um, the attributes of each eye and what um, kind of properties are there and um, kind of breakdown of each one? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it seems that each of these eyes was especially designed <laughs> to help us in a certain way. And um, my own personal, visceral, sensual experience of these eyes is um, uh, <clears throat> for example, the tail eye connecting us to the source of the mother water. Um, at one point when I was working with her, she even said to me, you, you know, I'm not even from this planet. And that was the first time I thought about the fact that yes, water does not come from here. It comes from outer space. And so you can even receive scientific knowledge from these nature beings, of course, and so then I start, got really curious and I started looking it up and I'm like, oh my God, right. <coughs> Water came to earth from outer space. Hmm. And this is really well known in the Hawaiian traditional knowledge. Um, they call her the, she's, she's the, at once the young woman and the old crone because she's the oldest element that's on the planet. And yet she's ever youthful. 
and very generous and kind. Um, so my experience, literally my visceral experience of um, connecting with my tail eye and using drinking in the nectar is that it kind of washes away anything that needs to be cleansed or dissolved or um, calmed, right, in the body system. Because the Andean medicine is always looking for the harmony between humans and the natural elements. And so if we have a disharmony with water, it's going to appear in our body in some way. It's going to manifest as an illness, like um, swelling in an area or um, any kind of disturbance of the balance, the harmony of water in the body. So literally working with her, you know, for a daily meditation and feeling kind of that cleansing. And also this amazing fact that <clears throat> when you drink the water up into the tail eye, what's right there is the cerebrospinal fluid that, that you can drink her up into your brain. And lo and behold, there's literally a tide, a tidal current that runs back and forth that all you cranial sacral therapists will know very well between our tail and our brain and the cerebrospinal fluid is going, you know, like a tide, just like the larger tide of the planet that's moving. And so for me, it's always this glorious connection between the bigger body of mother earth and my little tiny insignificant you know human body doing the same motion and the same kind of cleansing with its own tide and connecting those two tides is 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 delightful it's delicious <clears throat> so the action so we call you know when when energy gets stuck or stagnant in the body we call that hucha which is heavy energy or or energy that's not flowing properly and so bringing in drinking in the living energy of water the the finest living energy of the water to come into our body and touch all the water molecules in our body and um, dissolve away any energies that may not be flowing and releasing those back out so so this is the action and the gift of the water one of them yeah to, to name one <clears throat> um also when we go into that center we feel how it's connected to our creativity our sexuality our uh, motivating factor you know our motor our impetus for movement which they call ati in the in the tradition the the instinct to move like when you see babies start to locomote and then they they sit up first right and all that movement comes from the tail mm -hmm. and <clears throat> then we start to locomote and you know we want to check out the world and crawling and then you know standing up and touching stuff and what is this what is this and our whole proprioceptive um you know instincts to explore come from that center so um that's amazing uh and of course the water and working with other water beings they are the guardians of art and the written word and creativity and so our creativity is intimately connected with the the tail eye and the the water um beings and what they do right our muse you can listen to the water speak to you especially this ocean you see behind me you can listen to those waves and yeah. let that walk over you yeah as you were saying about the craniosacral it was like the waves were coming in and going out <laughs> <laughs> yep, my body starts doing like <laughs> Now you have to change the background for the, the earth then. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That would be great to have a different background. Well, you can see there's some land in the background. 
And when you connect your tail eye, and for me, the experience is immediate security, solidity, groundedness, calm, mm -hmm. relaxation. Um, your belly so eye, this is? Yes. For the belly eye, yeah, for the cosconiali, mm -hmm. the uh, stability, a sense of stability. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, St structure, you know, that's kind of, it, even though I am on an island where the land does become molten, <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's not as solid as we may like to think it is. Mm -hmm. I don't have it solid form, but it also has a liquid form. Um, <clears throat> but the earth is a very, very, uh, calming stabilizing force and and for me it has the i have the experience of the kind of the huchas anything that needs to be released from my body is being absorbed mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. we may know people who are very grounded and they are unruffled by whatever's happening and it's as if they're just absorbing you know, whatever chaos may be around them, it doesn't affect them because it just like goes through them and doesn't bother them. My husband is like this, he's unflappable. <laughs> and he has this powerful connection to Pachamama, as odd as that may be being men, but he's super Pachamama man. <laughs> so this kind of groundedness that stabilizes and secures you, it's it was like putting on my earth seat belt, you know, in a, in a kind of a funny way. Um, and so, and of course the power of Pachamama, my God, is another form of creativity. Of, look at how many different kinds of flowers she makes, you know. We're told in our lives we should have one career and we should focus ourselves on one thing. And, but Pachamama doesn't make only one kind of flower. In fact, she doesn't only make flowers, she makes trees and plants and animals and insects and all kinds of creatures. So the multitudinous generosity of Pachamama in having the personal connection with her, this stabilizing, just generous force, like you can just lay your body down on her and relax and feel held and feel so loved she's just so generous with her she absorbs all of all of our whatever we give out whatever it may be and constantly gives back to us i live on an organic orchard and i'm looking at fruit constantly being made by pachamama i'm not doing anything you know I'm a farmer. I don't make the food. I just pick it. It's there. <laughs> you know, I just try to tend to the, the health of the plants as best as I can. But she's creating all this. And there, I love that saying, fruits are the kisses of the Pachamama mm -hmm. that they have in the Andes. That they, they, she, she's expressing her love for us by giving us these delicious sweet sweets that she grows on her trees. Yeah. So that's the belly eye for me. <clears throat> um, and this is also um, kind of the force of our, our physical creative power in, the, in, the, in our world, right? To be able to, we call it yankai, the power of physical industriousness, industriousness making things happen. Mm -hmm. This is also such a mama power, making all these different plants and trees and, and connecting to that part of us that can can do that and of course the belly eye is also the center through which we can eat heavy energy and digest it but that's another story but that's one of the powers of this eye all of the eyes of the body can give and receive living energy and if you think about it all of the time uh, we're always sensing with these eyes whether it's unconscious or or more conscious as we begin to work with them. We say, I have a gut feeling about that, mm -hmm. right? That's our, that's the innate knowledge of the energy that's coming into our belly eye 
and being perceived and the information is being extracted from the environment and it's telling us something whether we listen to it or not that's another mm -hmm. that's another thing but mm -hmm. the information is coming in through mm -hmm. these eyes yeah um the heart eye <clears throat> for me is again it's it's generosity of inti but it's in the masculine form which is radiant and so offering um my huchas my energies that are ready to go into the sun and letting them be transformed or transmuted in the fire of the heart of the sun and feeling my own connection you know the incas were called the children of the sun they called themselves the children of the sun mm. and uh to have this direct visceral connection with uh the heart of father son in my heart and being able to drink in that golden nectar we all know what it feels like when you want to go out in the sun and just relish the warmth and light and delicious caress that you can feel from the beauty of sunlight warming us and to drink that in a deeper level into the heart and really allow your heart to be penetrated with filled with all this love it's a, another it's a dynamic radiant force while the earth is more of an absorbing force and the water is more of a dissolving force the, the sun is like radiant um <clears throat> masculine force and we know those people they come into the room and we say they light up the room mm. you know or you feel you can bask in the warmth of their presence right we have these ways of saying it in our language that for me is a translation a direct you know experience of this people just carry that sun in their heart and they give it out mm. so we can receive it and we can give it um for me the throat eye is connecting to the the wind is the spaciousness of uh and the flow of just connecting i love the wind i'm a singer i love sound i love it's very soothing and healing to me uh, and i think for anyone who's a speaker or a teacher or anyone who needs to communicate with another human being <laughs> <laughs> to work with this in our throat and 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 all these eyes connect to each other that's the other beauty of it it's like the the tail eye connected and feeding um harmonized with the earth in the belly and the belly eye harmonized and stabilizing the sun in our hearts and the sun coming up and being allowed to speak the truth of love through our voice, right? How often do we hold back love when we feel it in our hearts, but we don't let it out of our mouths? Or we hold back beauty, we see beauty and we were like, ah, ah, and then no shame, no, no embarrassment, I can't say that, you look so beautiful, or, to a stranger even, right? You see, I think we hold back beauty even more than we hold back um, our anger or our fear or other emotions that could be harm harming to others. I think we hold back our love as well. Mm -hmm. and, and when we open these eyes and allow that spaciousness in our throat eye and actually in the whole bubble to bring that wind that space kind of to cleanse away the huchas that need to move through us so it's another way of of cleaning the huchas in our body cleaning away this you know the stagnant or or uh, slowed energies that need to be moving for me it's like it's all emotional weather and the weather system of our body is like the weather system of our being we need to laugh and cry and we need to have rain and sun mm -hmm. and a wet earthy days and you know torrential rain at times we need this weather and this wind 
this is part of the health of our planet, literally in its, in her body and literally in our body, in our spiritual and emotional self to let all of these energies move through us freely. Mm -hmm. yeah, like if you look at kids, they go from laughing to yelling to crying to back to laughing, back to being loving. It's all, it's moving very freely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we just, we just hold on to it more tightly as we get older and we get a little jammed up in our systems. So working with these nyawis really allows for this freedom to come back in mm -hmm. and like a rejuvenation and a youthfulness to come back into our, into our being through these eyes. Um, then we have the fifth, sixth, and seventh eyes. These are also, of course, doors of perception through which we take in information, but we also can give looks that kill, right? <laughs> if looks could kill, we say that. Yeah. Or a sharp glance, ow. <laughs> a sharp glance, oh, and you can feel it, Yeah. right? Uh -huh. So we give and receive through all of our eyes. And, of course, the seventh eye here, in the Hindu system, you only get three. In the Andean system, you get seven eyes. Mm -hmm. And the seventh eye is the one connected, of course, most to the cosmos and the great mind, the universal mind, kind of the level that we think of as uh, the mystical, like when we think of people like Albert Einstein, whose genius expanded into the mystical level of, you know, trying <laughs> to comprehend the cosmos and science, right, is the true and accurate observation of nature. That's the definition of science. Mm. So the true and accurate observation of nature is something that indigenous people have been doing for thousands and thousands of years. And I think that's why there's a return to the knowledge that comes from the indigenous observers who look in different ways than our science, which is rational and abstracted and, and depersonalized. Mm -hmm. How can we have a knowledge that's depersonalized? It doesn't make sense, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. Repeatable, observable. I mean, all those things are good and, and I love science and I love what science can can bring us and discover, but I think it has to become personalized now. We know that because of the Schrodinger's cat experiment, right? The observer changes the experiment. Mm -hmm. So there we are, there's mm -hmm. the person. So we're influencing our world all the time with our energy field, with our perceptions, with our intentions. Mm. Yeah. And this is the way that we do it actually, literally through these energetic eyes through which we are receiving and transmitting energies all the time. And um, to become a seer in the Andean viewpoint is to open all these eyes and perceive, you know, not necessarily a visual perception, but an energetic perception. You know, for some of us, it may be visceral knowledge it may be intuitive knowledge where we just know something it may be <clears throat> it may be visual but it may be the other channels too so when we open these eyes and start to work with them the gifts are limitless literally limitless that come to us from being more connected i think more healthy more in harmony with our environment and um more at ease, more empowered, mm. all of those things. Mm. Yeah. Are, there, are there any negatives at all there? <laughs> um, not that I can think of, except for the fact that you, one does become more sensitized to one's environment. So if we're in an environment that's bombarding us, it may, you know, you, one has to navigate one's sensitivity. Mm. Yeah. But I think actually opening the nyawis helps you to do that too. Mm. Helps you be grounded in the most difficult circumstances and 
I know that for me, when I was a kid, I was so hypersensitive to everything. I never went to a rock concert in my life as a teenager because I just, ah, it's too much. <laughs> and now because of these practices, I can literally walk through the middle of, you know, downtown Manhattan and I can feel completely stabilized and grounded and, and able to handle. Mm. So, but it's just that I choose to live in an, an environment that, that is mostly Sami, mostly nectar, mostly nature, mm -hmm. because I get, I have the, you know, the privilege of being able to choose where I live, mm -hmm. you know, amazing. And I just prefer that environment. Mm -hmm. So someone else might really prefer to be in a subway in Manhattan. <laughs> that's all good, right? Mm -hmm. Cause we're all different and we are all needed in different spots. So. Yeah. yeah. So there's nothing that I could really say is negative, except if you try to do it too fast or too much, or, you know, that this is an organic process mm -hmm. and working with the Nyawis and allowing just the right amount of energy in for you at that time. And it's a, it's an evolving process. So, yeah, I, negatives, I can't really think of any, honestly. Mm -hmm. And you? <laughs> well, I was kind of thinking about, like, um, there's, I always have a certain kind of re reverence, you know, when I go to some of these places, and there's, like, a fear that comes up sometimes, you know, um, like, you know, when you go into, like, a sacred place, you know, there's just this kind of, like, oh, or, or you know, not even... Um, a sacred place but could be like when you go to like a beach like that's behind you and have a little bit of a fear of like swimming in the water or something like that and then but then when you you offer your breath you know and you receive then it's like okay I'm, I feel a bit more welcome now you know so it's like it's until you make the connection that there's you know there's this kind of like a little bit of hoochie there really isn't it uh, i see what you're saying yeah and once you whirl, realize that everything's looking at you too right mm -hmm. we're seeing all these nature beings they're looking at us too mm -hmm. and we're being seen and that can be like a little bit of oh oh my god mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what the camera say you cannot break a pact because pachamama Mother Earth and all the mountain spirits saw you and witnessed you making that promise. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it's not just the people, mm -hmm. right? That you made the promise to, it's everybody else. Mm -hmm. So if you break that, that's serious. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, another, it's another point of view. It's a bit of a deeper point of view and every, everything's listening to us and, and everything's responding. <clears throat> Ooh, another great story is going to a beautiful spring and speaking to the spirit of the spring and making offerings to the spirit of the spring. And, and two days later, that spring that was dried up for the last five, the previous five years is running again. Yes. And it's amazing that yeah. there's this incredible response from nature once we start really speaking to her. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. feeling the awe of a powerful place i think is great my sign for me is if i start like i trip and then i'm like uh oh i didn't make an offering or i didn't stop and ask permission to enter this place yeah i i stub my toe mm -hmm. and like watch your mama's like hey wake up girl remember <laughs> you know, come in here with respect and reverence and and for my boys who grew up here and they're surfer dudes, to this day, when they go down to the ocean with their surfboards, they stand in front of the water with their heads bowed and they're saying their prayers and asking permission to enter the, the powerful being that is the water and, and to ask, asking to be kept safe and being held, you know, for, for if you have permission and blessing to be in the water. Mm -hmm. and. Isn't that so much nicer? Mm -hmm. We wouldn't 
just go busting into somebody's house and, you know, like looking around and start taking things out of the cupboards, right? You ring the doorbell. Hi, may I come in, right? You maybe bring a gift to someone's house when you go there. Yeah. So it's the same kind of courtesy. Mm -hmm. It's like common courtesy, but with our larger living world. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, so um, I suppose the last question I would ask is, can you remember what it was like for you before you came to the tradition and what way how much your life has changed and what effects that this has like had on you working with the Nyawis on a on a daily basis so oh, God. oh. <laughs> try and just put that into like a little nutshell like oh my gosh <clears throat> Well, for one thing, I was a very ungrounded person. I was very, I would very easily go like galactic. I wanted to be out in the cosmos and I didn't feel at home on the planet. Mm. And I think if there's one thing that this tradition has given me, it's my home on the planet and feeling like, oh my God, of course I want to be here. Are you kidding? It's like nectar haven nectar central where else is there to be this is gorgeous and glorious and i didn't know that living could be like this so much happiness so much joy such a feeling of of freedom i guess i i always have a sense i don't know maybe it's because somehow i'm in innately a paco but i think everybody is innately uh connected to nature and just feels it in different degrees and there's a little nudge inside me that's like I'm not comfortable I'm not comfortable I'm not comfortable oh I need to make an offering mm. right and I make the offering and then ha huh. mm -hmm. it's like that feeling when you finally clean the fridge it's like you know there's little moldy things in the back and you need to get them out and and you get back in there and you clean it and you do what you know needs to be done and then you just feel this Ah, oh, it feels so much better. Mm -hmm. And it's that same kind of feeling, like knowing how, having the tools to uh, have this relationship with nature, feeling like I'm not crazy, right? Because I'm per I was always perceiving these things, talking to trees as a kid, right? Hearing the wind, the river calling me and like, oh, you're just, imaginative child right oh that's not real right being told that and then finding out hey uh -uh, that is even more real <laughs> yeah and just the i don't know just kind of an order and an a beauty to life in general uh, a meaning so much deeper um being able to share this beautiful knowledge with others is such is what the gift that i was given by having the crazy kind of indiana jones nutty kind of adventure that i had that took me into this path like i really needed a brick on the head bam let me show you some crazy stuff mm -hmm. And I needed the word impossible to be shredded out of my dictionary. <laughs> and that's what I got. So just having the joy to inhabit a much more vibrant, much more expanded vision of reality than what I grew up with learning was, was real and true. It's like, it feels like a tiny little cage that I was in to a beautiful jewel of mm. an existence, you know, opening up and, and flowering out and being in a more real reality. That's how it feels to me. Mm. Where happiness is what you're supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pachamama and the Apus, they want us to be happy. They are loving parents, you know, teachers, aunties, and uncles. And if you connect with a mountain, think of all the things a mountain has seen in its lifetime. 
that it can share with you. When, when I was writing my book, and this is such a crazy, and I learned about, we have, you know, not two, two human parents, well, you have two human parents and two nature parents. You know, the water at which you're born and the mountain overseeing the area or hill or, you know, we have a masculine and feminine nature parents that are here to help us live. And actually my experience, and they, and they have the keys to our destiny. They have the living energy, the knowledge, the information for our destiny. And, you know, we receive our body and our DNA from our human parents. We receive our beginning from them, but we, see, we receive our, our destiny, our ability to accomplish our destiny from our nature mom and dad. And my nature mom like sat me down on the banks of her river in New York City the first time I had a real full-blown encounter with her. And she told me my book was not coming out of the publishers. And she sat me down and said, this is what you need to, I flow by the office of your editor every day. I can tell you what's going on in there and what she's thinking. And this is what you need to go in and say to her to get your book moving and to get it published. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> wow. And that's what I did and that's what happened. And, and that was certainly a step forward for me on my path of accomplishing my destiny. And it was everything to do with my, my nature mom, my paperina, uh, also known as the Hudson River in New York City. And oh my God, what gratitude to her. She's a lot of people's nature mom. Mm. And I feel sad when I think of people not being connected to their nature parents. Mm. Because it's not in our educational system. It's not in our worldview in the Western world. And in fact, we think of that as somehow backwards thinking, you know, is it like, oh, some kind of, I don't know, like, superstition right but it's not that at all it's mm -hmm. living energy it's physics it's actually the most modern viewpoint everything is living energy everything has a consciousness of course we can communicate with that who was it that landed that plane in the hudson river was it that pilot guy that sally guy or was it my beautiful nature mom saving those people Ah, mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing! Oh my goodness, I'm I'm all out of all out of questions. Well, oh, my nephew, I'm probably thinking of loads more here, but that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure, such yeah. an honor. Thank you. Thank Give you. Me. I'm really looking forward to your class. I'm taking it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yo and yowies <laughs> yeah we can really see the difference there now but yeah that would be great thank you so much that's going to give everybody like a better understanding of you know what what um the yowies are about and um yeah. how you can work with them in all these different ways so thank you thank you so much aloha aloha <laughs>